At the tip of our planet, beneath the icy Earth, there's a looming threat. This permafrost stores vast amounts of carbon, and as burning fossil fuels heats our planet and the soils thaw, that ticking time bomb of greenhouse gases gets closer and closer to exploding. Except does it? Because depending on who you ask, this is either one of the most perilous tipping points for our planet, or not a tipping point at all. So could permafrost really cause runaway heating? If not, does that mean we're safe? And what should we be doing to keep permafrost permanently frozen? I'm Adam, a climate scientist with a PhD from Oxford, sharing what you need to know about climate change. And today I want to talk with you about the icy realms of the Arctic Circle, and what might happen if the frost thaws. Spoiler alert, it's bad. But it's not game over. Now, I know I said if permafrost thaws, but this isn't hypothetical. After all, burning fossil fuels and mass agriculture are churning out greenhouse gases and heating our planet. And nowhere are these changes being felt more keenly than the Arctic. The region is heating four times faster than the planet as a whole. That's because of a process climate scientists long predicted. Arctic amplification, where reflective sea ice melts, revealing the dark waters below. Since the water absorbs sunlight far better, it heats up even more and, well, that's why the Arctic is burning up. Literally. As the area rapidly heats, the landscape of northern regions of land are changing rapidly. This is having acute impacts on Arctic wildlife as well as indigenous peoples, causing flooding, coastal erosion, and damage to infrastructure. And the changes at the northern tip of the planet aren't isolated to that region. They're impacting weather patterns across the planet, and all these shifts are being felt profoundly by permafrost. Now, permafrost is land that is, well, land that is permanently frosty, or to use the strict definition, frozen for at least two years. Now, fair, at least two year frost doesn't have the same ring to it, so permafrost it is. This permafrost stores vast amounts of carbon, and this is a big deal because of course, the heating is starting to thaw the permafrost. Okay, but how much carbon and how big a deal? I was wondering when you'd show up. Well, researchers estimate there's at least one trillion tons of carbon locked up in permafrost soils. That's about 50% more than there is in the entire atmosphere today. As the permafrost defrosts, it would release the carbon it's storing into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and methane, the two gases that are responsible for the most climate change. By the way, I'm planning a video on all the natural sources of methane and how heating the planet is affecting them. Subscribe so you don't miss it. And while you're clicking on things, a like and a comment would be pretty nice too. But when it comes to the greenhouse gases from permafrost, exactly how big a deal they'd be is still an open question. You mean scientists haven't been able to work it out yet? That's right but here's what we know so far. Permafrost releasing carbon would be what climate scientists call a positive feedback for the planet. Now, honestly, I hate this term because it sounds more like constructive criticism for planet Earth. Have you thought about another geomagnetic reversal? Tragically, that's not what positive feedback means. In this case, it indicates that permafrost would boost the heating that we're causing. That's because heating causes it to thaw, causing the release of greenhouse gases, which causes even more heating. On top of this, massive chunks of permafrost could suddenly collapse and thaw. When permafrost contains a lot of ice, which melts, Else, that can transform the landscape into thermocast. These features can grow quickly since the liquid water makes them unstable and conducts heat to surrounding frosty soils. And these rapid collapses of permafrost to thermocast aren't some future threat. This is already happening now. So this is all sounding a lot like a tipping point. Well, actually, there's no evidence that permafrost as a whole has passed a tipping point. And honestly, there's not even rock solid evidence that a tipping point even exists. How can you say that? I mean, you said yourself that this is a feedback. I did. 
But not all feedback mechanisms are tipping points. You see, a tipping point is a point of no return, where once we push the planet too far, the changes start happening by themselves. And once you've tipped, it's very hard to get back to where you started. So, for example, researchers are worried that the AMOC, a crucial ocean circulation, could effectively shut down, or that the Amazon could stop functioning as a rainforest. Now, when it comes to permafrost, scientists have estimated how much greenhouse gas it could release, how fast. And while that would cause extra heating, it doesn't look like it would cause enough that permafrost would enter a vicious cycle of thawing even more, then causing even more heating, then thawing even more. In other words, it wouldn't cause a global tipping point. Now, there is another permafrost process that could push things even further, called a compost bomb. Well, that sounds like a tipping point. That's what some researchers have been afraid of. The idea is that as permafrost thaws, it would decay, just like a pile of compost. And just like a pile of compost, this would cause it to give off heat. So could that extra heat be enough to cause a vicious cycle of heating and thawing and emitting? That would be the fear. But so far, again, the evidence suggests that this process could not cause permafrost to spiral out of control. Okay, but that's for gradual thawing. What about the sudden changes that you spoke about? You mean thermocasts? Right, and that literally involves stuff tipping into lakes, so surely that would make permafrost a tipping point? Well, maybe. But maybe not. Oh my god, this is infuriating. I get you, but it's not clear cut. Like when thermocast forms, that can be like a tipping point for that local area. It's like a domino falling on its own. Sure, that's a dramatic fall for that domino, but it doesn't necessarily affect the big picture. Okay, but that's not normally the issue with dominoes. The issue is normally them knocking each other over in a chain reaction. So could thermocast forming trigger the formation of more? And could that spiral to all the permafrost collapsing? The answer to those questions is, Yes, and probably not. Please clarify. One domino could definitely knock over a bunch of dominoes in its region, but because of gaps and inconsistencies in how the permafrost is laid out, many researchers argue this couldn't cause a chain reaction across all permafrost. So then we'd see particular areas of permafrost tipping, suddenly thawing and releasing a bunch of greenhouse gases. That's what headlines like these are normally talking about. But from a global climate perspective, what we'd see would be much more gradual and continuous. The more warming, the more dominoes get knocked over, the more permafrost thaws. And there's not a point where that story suddenly changes. Well, frankly, this makes zero sense. Oh, I thought that was a solid analogy. The analogy is fine, but I keep seeing headlines like these talking about a permafrost tipping point. And this is like the official map of tipping points, and there's permafrost right on it as something that could be triggered with less than two degrees of global warming. And now you're saying there might not be a permafrost tipping point at all? Yeah, honestly, if you're confused, fair enough. Researching this video has been a bit of a minefield. On the one hand, you get researchers stating point blank that there is no tipping point. And on the other, you get permafrost held up as the poster child of tipping points. I think a part of the confusion is that specific regions could indeed suddenly shift. But that doesn't mean that's what we'd see for permafrost as a whole. It means a few dominoes getting knocked over at a time, not all the dominoes falling. So this is kind of the iconic tipping point paper, and I spoke with its lead author, David A. Mackay, who gave me some feedback on this script. You should give him a follow on Blue Sky here. I asked David why permafrost is included on their paper's list. He explained when they say permafrost could tip around 1.5 degrees of global warming, they more mean that permafrost losses like these could become widespread at that temperature. But that could well happen as a gradual, continuous shift. But that's not what I think of when I think of a tipping point. I think of it as a level of heating where a major aspect of the climate 
tips to a different state. Yeah, and honestly, I definitely don't think that gradual shift is what comes to mind when you read the coverage of that study, or even glancing over the study itself. I definitely know people who've read these headlines or seen this map and think that once we hit 1.5 degrees, that's game over for permafrost. And then that would mean vast amounts of warming would suddenly kick in. Okay, but can we be sure that that won't happen? I mean, would you bet on it? I mean, I probably would, but I wouldn't bet my life savings. My gut feeling from this research is that just because there's not concrete evidence for global tipping point, that doesn't mean for sure there isn't one. One of the central things we know about permafrost is that there's lots we don't know about permafrost. It's just really complex with so many different factors, vegetation, ice presence, soil types, terrain. And it's likely that most of our computer simulations of it are missing just how quickly it would decay. So my conclusion would be that the evidence today doesn't point to a global tipping point, but we probably shouldn't rule one out. I mean, that's vaguely reassuring, but what do we even do with this information? I mean, if there's no one tipping point, does that mean there's no need to worry? While it might take the pressure off a tiny bit, there's definitely no reason to feel chill. Take this study. It's all about there not being a global tipping point. And their conclusion is still that that means there's no safe line in the sand. Any amount of thaw sucks. The more we heat the planet, the more permafrost melts and the more extra heat that causes. And every single fraction of a degree of heating means more extreme weather, more sea level rise, more people forced from their homes. Wow, I'm just learning so much about tipping points. Is there any way that I can tip you to show my gratitude? What a generous and genuine question. You can support the channel up here to help keep things ad and product placement free. Okay, now, Back to permafrost. You've said that Thor won't suddenly jump to a vicious cycle. Probably. Right. But you haven't said much about the other tipping points trait, that they're irreversible. Well, when it comes to permafrost, that's something that scientists agree on much more. Any thaw would be extremely hard to reverse. Even if we overshot our climate targets and then bring the temperatures back down again. So that means once the greenhouse gases are out of the permafrost, they could be out for a long, long time. Time. Well then, is there anything we can do to stop them getting out? Oh my god, imagine if I just said no and then ended the video. Please do not do that. Well, luckily there's a bunch of things we can and should be doing to protect permafrost, which means protecting ourselves. Top of the list has to be monitoring permafrost as carefully as possible, so we know what's happening and what we can expect to happen. That's not only technically challenging, but vast amounts of permafrost are also within Russia, which, well, international collaboration with Russia isn't exactly going smoothly since that whole invasion of Ukraine. Okay, but what about actually protecting permafrost? Well, there are some things we can do in the Arctic region to help, like protecting vegetation and managing water better. There are also some more radical suggestions, like introducing large animals to graze, which could help reinforce the permafrost. Generally, the these suggestions, like all geoengineering ideas, aren't magical get out of jail free cards. They might well have unintended side effects and might well just not really work. Ultimately, and you're going to be shocked to hear me say this, we need to limit global warming. Never heard you say that before. I'll stop saying it when we stop causing it. That means stopping burning fossil fuels and shifting agriculture. Because until we do that, we're going to keep heating the planet, which is going to keep knocking over dominoes and keep permafrost emitting even more greenhouse gases. But as scary as the permafrost situation is, and I'm going to be frank, I do find it scary, 
The lesson isn't, we've passed the tipping point, it's too late. Now, there are people out there who want to believe that, that it's game over. Because if it's game over, then we don't have any responsibility. We can just throw up our hands and say, not my problem. But the real lesson is that every bit of emissions we pump into our atmosphere matters profoundly. And that means every bit of emissions we can avoid matters profoundly. Emissions avoid protects permafrost, protects us, saves lives across the planet. And we're only just beginning to understand just how many lives are at stake. Here's how. Okay, until next time. Bye. You know, it's good writing when instead of making it better, you just comment on it.